Well, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. My name is Scott Fisher. I'm one of the pastors here at Delaware Valley Christian Church, and we're glad that you could be with us uh, for our service today, and also as we uh, open, at this point in our service, we open God's Word, and we allow the, the Word of God to speak to us um, through the Spirit of God, empowering His Word. I do want to mention, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, normal order of our service, you may be saying, well, what happened to communion and the offering <laughs> meditations? We haven't forgotten about them. We're going to do something a little different uh, this week because of the nature of the message this morning, and we will be uh, having our time of communion uh, in just a few moments, and we'll be doing that um, in conjunction with the message this morning. So, you didn't miss it. Uh, we're not going to skip it. Uh, it's coming in just a few moments. Uh, we are in a, a special series during the month of November called The Attitude of Gratitude, and uh, we've looked at already at several uh, themes along the area of giving thanks and having thankful hearts to God, and that's a, a helpful uh, discipline for us at any time, uh, especially helpful for us in these turbulent times uh, that we're going through. And we've looked at, uh, the first week we looked at giving God his due, uh, recognizing that God is worthy of thanks simply because he is God. And then last week we looked at uh, tuning our hearts to thanksgiving and how we can allow our hearts to be in step with, with, with God. And no matter what our circumstances are, that as the scripture calls us, we can give thanks in every circumstance uh, because of, of who God is and because the, of the truths of what he has done for us uh, are outside of and beyond our circumstances. And this week, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, an attitude of gratitude related to the gift of Jesus. That's what we're calling uh, this particular week's sermon, The Gift of Jesus. And so we want to read a couple of scriptures to, uh, to frame our thoughts. Where be, these scriptures are both from 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 9. And 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 10 to 15. Uh, we will have the verses up there on the screen, uh, as we normally do for you to follow. Or if you'd like to follow in your Bible at home, uh, that would be great either way. I will be reading from 2 Corinthians, first of all, 2 Corinthians 8, starting in verse 7. And the Apostle Paul writes this, But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And then a little later in the same book, or same epistle of 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes this, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you, because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. And then notice how Paul ends this section in verse 15. He says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we can open your word. We thank you for your word that you have given to us, that we might know your will, that we might know your thoughts your desires, what you have done for us through your Son, so we might know you. And Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to communicate with us, and we thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit to help us understand your word. 
And Lord, we know that as we come together today, we come from many different situations, many different circumstances, and we know that what binds our hearts together is our common faith in you. And we pray that this morning, as we lift our hearts to you and we allow your word to speak to us, that you would touch each one of our hearts according to our need this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a story told about a famous evangelist, someone who was born in 1860, uh, obviously the 19th century, was a world famous evangelist up until like the 1930s and 40s. His name was Rodney Simon Smith. His name was Rodney Simon Smith, but that's not how the world uh, came to know him. They came to know him by a different name, and that name was given to him because as a young young boy, as a young, a young uh, teenager, he lived in England and he came from a gypsy family. And the famous American evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, who you've no doubt heard of, went to England to do a series of preaching, uh, evangelistic uh, preaching rallies. And at that time in England, the members of the gypsy community uh, were not allowed to... Um, to come to the rallies because they had a reputation for stealing and pilfering and on and different kinds of crime. And this young man, Rodney Simon Smith, was part of and was raised in this gypsy community. Uh, but that didn't stop D.L. Moody. Uh, D.L. Moody uh, said, I want to go to this uh, gypsy community in England and I want to bring them the good news of Jesus. And he brought the gospel to that gypsy community and during one of those meetings, this this young man, Rodney, placed his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he became a great evangelist. And his name that he was known by as an evangelist was Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith, a very famous evangelist. And he preached the gospel all over the world uh, up until he was in his 80s. And he had a, a very strong and vibrant uh, relationship with Christ, and it and it just you know oozed out of him. And the story is told that when he was in his 80s, someone asked him one time uh, when he was at a meeting. They said, you know, Gypsy Smith, what's what's the secret of your vibrancy and your relationship with Christ? What 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 is it that that has kept you going all these years into your into your 80s? Uh, what, 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 is, what is the secret? What would you say the secret is? And Gypsy Smith said this. He said, I have never lost, I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. The wonder of all that God had done for him in Christ. And a number of years later, a famous uh, gospel songwriter uh, took those words of Gypsy Smith and, and wrote a song uh, based on his words. I'll just read a couple of the lines. They'll be up there on the screen for you. Once so aimlessly I wandered round the tangled paths of sin. All about me seemed so hopeless. Doubts and fears without within. Then a voice so kind and gentle spoke sweet peace unto my soul. Gone my days of sin and wandering since the Savior made me whole. And then the refrain, I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all. I have always found this story about Gypsy Smith and his statement, I have never lost the wonder of it all, to be for me both in a tremendous encouragement to my own heart and a tremendous challenge to keep in front of me always, the wonder of what God has done for me, for us, in sending the
the gift of his son, the gift of Jesus. And when we read the New Testament, we get the same sense that Gypsy Smith communicates from the Apostle Paul. And I hope through our series on, on the Whatever series, where we looked a lot at Philippians and the life of Paul and some of the things we've already mentioned in this series, I hope you're picking up this central theme for the Apostle Paul, who always puts the gift of Jesus and salvation, what we call the gospel, the good news that, that God sent his son into the world to save us, that Paul always brings that front and center in all of his thinking. And he, we see it again in this passage that we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And the context of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, so we understand, is Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers about and challenging them about the need for them to provide financial and material help to believers who were suffering. And Paul is writing to them about giving, about the discipline of giving, and he calls it the grace of giving. And so he's talking about very practical and tangible truths uh, to these Corinthians about helping their fellow believers. And he does it, and he, and he challenges them to be generous and cheerful and grace-filled. And his appeal to them, as Paul's appeal always is, is based and rooted in what Jesus has done for them. It's always rooted in what Jesus has done for them. Notice again, chapter 8, verse 9. As part of his appeal, he says to the Corinthians, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And so he appeals to them on giving with this background of what Christ has done for them. And then at the end of this section of teaching on giving, Paul, as he comes to the end of this whole section, and I would encourage you to read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, has a lot of rich truth about giving. And in, in a little while, we'll talk about the opportunities to give here at, um, at Delaware Valley Christian Church. But at the very end, Paul lifts up his voice and his heart in this expression to God. He comes to the end of this section and is teaching on giving. And it's, it's like his benediction and his, his statement that covers the whole topic of giving. And he says this, verse 15, notice again, 915, Thanks be to God for his what? Thanks be to God for his in expressible gift. It's like Paul draws back and he steps back and in a burst of, of praise that just flows out of Paul's heart, he says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. And as we read this, sometimes when we read that, we say, what's he talking about? And it seems certain that Paul is not referring to the financial gifts that the Corinthians are going to give or have given, as important as those are. But to the ultimate gift which inspires those gifts, and that is the gift of Jesus. The gift of Jesus. And notice that the gift is so profound and so deep, the gift of Jesus, that Paul calls it inexpressible. It's inexpressible. What was Paul mean? He means words Human words are not adequate to really express what that gift means. Human words fail. It is similar to what Gypsy Smith says when he says, I never got over the wonder of it all. The wonder of it all. When we say something fills us with wonder, it means it's, it's, it's beyond our human comprehension. We can feel it, we can access it through our hearts, but we can't fully grasp all that it means. And what makes it inexpressible? Well, there are a number of things that make it inexpressible, but one key aspect that makes it inexpressible is that it represents an amazing and inexpressible love that God has for us. 
It's inexpressible because it is given and motivated by an inexpressible love that God has for us, which motivated, we know in Scripture, the Father to send the Son from the, from the glories of heaven and the fellowship they enjoyed for all of eternity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to send the Son into this, this dark world, this, this tragic, sin-filled planet, and for the Son to willingly come and take on humanity, to become a man, as the Scripture tells us, and not just take on humanity, but as a perfect and holy and righteous person, the only perfect person who ever lived, take upon himself our sin on the cross and give us his righteousness. That's what makes it inexpressible is that the, partly it's that love that motivated it, which we can't really comprehend. L listen to what one, one writer wrote about this that I, I find very enlightening. It's, the language is a little bit you know, dated, but just, just try to follow along with what he's saying. Notice he says, we know love, we know lo human love, its limitations, its changes, its extravagances, its shortcomings, and cannot but feel how unworthy it is to mirror for us that perfection in God, which we venture to name by a name so soiled. He's saying, you know, we, we know what human love is like, and, it, 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 and often in Scripture, human love and God's love are compared, but then he says the analogies between what we call love in man and love in God, those comparisons, must be supplemented, he says, by the differences between them. So they're similar, he says, but there's a gap between them. If we are ever to approach, he says, a worthy conception of the unspeakable or unexpressible love that underlies the unspeakable or the unexpressible gift. What's he saying? He's saying this. This is the way I apply it to my heart. I know how much I love my family. I know how much I love my wife. I know how much I love my children, my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my family, and other people in my life. I know what I feel. It's, it's hard for me to really express what I feel for my, for my family and for those I love. I know how deep that love is. Then to realize, to try to comprehend that God's love is infinitely greater, infinitely stronger, infinitely purer than any of the love that I have on my best days and in my best moments. So it helps us to say, well, if, if I love my wife or my spouse or my my brothers, my sisters, my children, what, whoever that is in your life that you, that you can think of, if I know how much I love them with so much, and God's love, and I'm fallen, and I'm a sinner, and I am inconsistent, and I struggle, and God's love is infinitely greater, how much, how much does God love me? How much does God love me who sent his son to be my savior? The love of God is pure and consistent and infinitely greater. And it is shown in this inexpressible gift of sending his son to be the foundation for everything in our life, in our Christian life. And it is, for Gypsy Smith, he said, I never got over the wonder of it all. And Paul emphasizes something very similar and in, in another place in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 3, notice what Paul says in Ephesians 3 about the love of Christ. He says, 3.14, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, notice, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded, in notice, in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And then notice what he says, and to what? To know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. 
that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. What Paul is saying is the same idea. It's the love of Christ we are, is inexpressible. It's wonderful. And Paul says here we need to grow. His prayer is that we would grow and deepen in our comprehension of that love, even though we will never fully understand it. And Paul is not writing here to those who do not know Jesus. He's writing to people who have placed their faith in Jesus, but he's saying that the calling is, with God's help, is to deepen our understanding of his love, the infinite love that he has for us. And I know for, for, for my own heart, um, I can tell you this, um, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is something that God has been speaking to me about recently. He's been speaking to me very directly about my need to deepen my understanding and appreciation of the love that he has for me and the love that he has for you. And I, I will confess that my mind very often goes in all kinds of directions and I am being refreshed in my heart during this season of contemplation and meditation on how much we are loved, how inexpressible that gift is. And one of the ways we have, we have uh, to, that God has given us as a, as a body of Christ to, as a group of people, re regularly remember and give thanks for the gift of Jesus is communion. And that's why this week we want to do something different. I feel like this ties right into our communion time. This is really why God gave us communion, why Jesus gave us communion as he told his disciples in the upper room at the Last Supper. Uh, it is a time to focus weekly. It says as often as you do it, and we do it at our church weekly, it's a time for us as individuals and as a body to come together around what we call the Lord's Table. Sometimes we call it communion because it's a fellowship together. It's also called historically the Eucharist, which means the giving of thanks, from the Greek for giving of thanks. And we do this each week to remember, to focus our hearts and minds on the gift of Jesus. I'll remind you of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and notice, and when he had done what? When he had given thanks. When Jesus had given thanks, it says, he broke it, the bread, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Think of the amazing love and grace of Jesus as he instituted the Lord's table at the final Passover meal that he was eating. And when they, the Jewish people uh, practiced Passover, they were giving thanks, of course, uh, for the deliverance of the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. But Jesus is the Passover lamb, according to the scripture. He's the fulfillment of everything the Passover pictures. And so he takes these elements that were common to the Passover, and he says, do this in remembrance of me. He says, the bread is my body, and the, and the cup is my blood. The bread is my body, and the cup is my blood. And so that is what Jesus is saying we are to give thanks for. And Jesus knew all that that would cost him. He knew all that that would cost him, and yet he says, give thanks. And let's remember that it tells us that as we do this, it goes on to tell us in verse 26, notice, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is literally a proclamation of the gospel, of the good news. And so as we've been doing each week, this will be a time for us to take communion. Um, you can use whatever you have. I happen to have a, a, a cracker. And I have a cup of juice here um, that I will be um, uh, participating in the communion. But as we've said, you can take some, some juice that you have at home or some bread or whatever you have. And let's, let's take a moment to think about what it means that we give thanks for the inexpressible gift of Jesus. So I'm going to pray. And then after I pray, you can um, pause 
uh, the video uh, and, and take communion and then restart the video and we'll come back and finish uh, our message this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these elements, uh, the, the bread and the juice that remind us of all that Jesus has done for us by paying for our sins on the cross. And we do lift up and give our heart, give thanks to you for the inexpressible gift of Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Another uh, opportunity that we have each week is to remember the opportunity that we are given uh, to give. And we talked about that uh, a, little, a little earlier in chapter in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, which was about giving. And another way that we express gratitude to God is through our giving. And, uh, you know, we, we can think of giving as just like a really practical thing. We write a check or we have it removed from our bank account or we give online, however we do it. Let's, let's remember that, as we saw earlier, the Apostle Paul elevates giving to a very, very significant, he calls it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9.13, a confession of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because we give because our hearts have been changed by Jesus. And we want to be part of his work in the world. And so I want, let's remember that as we give this week, however you give. And you can give in num any number of ways. Remember, you're ultimately giving to the Lord, not to the church. But as a body of Christ, we take the funds that you give and we seek to use them to build this kingdom. So you can give online at our, our website, www.dbcc.org. Uh, you can write a check and send it to the uh, church office if you would pre prefer to do that. Um, there are many different, different ways that you can give. But um, let's take a moment and just pray for the offering for this week. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, to give. We thank you for the opportunity to spread your kingdom around the world. And we thank you, Lord, for the many faithful uh, saints of yours at DBCC that have helped sustain the work through these many months. We pray for your uh, provision and your direction to use these funds to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, let's ask God to fill our hearts with this inexpressible gratitude, with this inexpressible gift that he would fill our hearts with all that it means that Jesus was sent for us. I hope that you have a great week. I hope that your heart is filled with the love of Christ this week. And if you're watching uh, today and you have never yet placed your faith in Jesus, if you have questions about that, please feel free to contact, contact us at info at visitdbcc.org or call the church office. We will be glad to talk to you. But if you understand, if you feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, if you feel that you, know, that you sense that God is calling you to himself, this would be the day to just simply place your faith in Christ, call out to Jesus, and he will save you, as the scripture says. Thank you for being with us, and have a great day.